From today, Germany will be the president of the EU for six months and also head the UNSC for a period of one month. And we also know that Germany is also going to head the FATF. So a lot of uh, uh, multilateral institutions which will be headed by Germany. And uh, to discuss about Germany's role in European continent and various multilateral organizations which it, it is going to head with me is uh, the German envoy and the EU envoy to India. So welcome to Vion and um, Starting with you, Walter, sir, my first question to you is uh, Germany's role in these multilateral organizations, especially amidst the global pandemic. Uh, uh, we have seen that 2020 hasn't been a very normal year. So how will Germany make sure that um, things go uh, proper or perhaps come to normalcy in a few months from now? Yes, hello, Sidanti. It's good to be on Beyond again. Uh, it's, it's nice to see you again, even if it's only through a screen here. Um, it's indeed true. Um, we have uh, today, it's uh, the, the day where we take over the presidency in the, uh, the monthly uh, rotating presidency in the Security Council, UN, and uh, in the EU six month uh, rotating presidency of the Council. Both are different issues, of course, both are different tasks, but it shows that we have some uh, additional uh, added responsibility this month. You are right, the world is pretty much in a crisis through Corona. Some countries have gotten through most better or not. Others are still in it, like the US, like India, like uh, Brazil, like other countries. But we all are affected, all across the board we are affected, all 192 countries in the world are affected still. Now in the Security Council this means um, we are um, trying to put again, as the French uh, presidency last month did it, put again on the agenda uh, the coronavirus and uh, the, the, the topic uh, pandemic as a threat to international peace. Uh, we think this is the case and not only for humanitarian reasons or for repercussions on the peacekeepers, but for general reasons, as well as we do think that uh, the uh, uh, crisis, uh, the uh, uh, climate change is also a threat to international security. So both topics should be dealt with also in the Security Council. And of course, apart from that, we have a lot of other topics, crisis uh, are abundant in the world. Now on the EU um, <clears throat> presidency, of course, we have prepared a very ambitious program for the next six months before Corona came. Then Corona came and of course now things are different because everything is dominated by this uh, topic. So this will be number one priority. How, we, uh, how is the EU's ability to get through this crisis? How do we um, uh, get rid of the virus? How do we find vaccines? How do we have an international response on it? How do we get out? How do we exit the crisis? Hopefully in a very um, uh, analog way uh, among the EU countries. And then how do we face the repercussions, the economic repercussions? We have a, a huge package of uh, support for solidarity among the European countries and outside as well. And how do we deal with the international implications of it? Uh, the restart of economies should be done in a, in a very social way, in a very um, uh, uh, a green way, <clears throat> learning from the from the from the lessons before. So this will be a big topic. Second topic will be, of course, our relationship towards the United Kingdom. Uh, they have left the EU. Uh, we regretted it, but they have regretted. They have left the EU, and now we see whether there can be achieved uh, a deal achieved, or will it be a hard Brexit? We hope there is a possibility of a deal, and then this is the. Uh, the, the long-term household, the uh, uh, budget of the European community, and then our, our flagship projects, of course, and topics which we always have, which is uh, green uh, recovery and um, green deal, uh, environmental protection, digitalization, and um, IT, making the European Union um, an, 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 a global, better even global factor of the future of work. So there are a lot of topics which we will have there. But uh, let me add this also, it's the, the circumstances are, of course, a bit difficult. Travel restrictions everywhere and also homework everywhere. So what we do here, we do also in New York and we do also in Brussels. Working from our home offices and maybe only 10, 20% of the meetings can be done 
in person, which is the DNA of, of any international institution to work and see your partners and to make deals, compromises in the, in, in the couloirs, you know. If you, if you can do this, it adds an additional um, uh, challenge to all these um, uh, uh, content uh, challenges. So we will see what we can do. We, it's not the first time we have these presidencies in these two bodies. Um, but um, it's a especially challenge, challenging time, but we have a good a chancellor who has 15, 16 years of experience. So I'm trusting uh, this will be a successful presidency. Mm. A successful presidency. Sir, uh, Ugo, sir, coming to you, how do you see Germany's role in Europe? We know that Germany and France are considered as the two wheels of European Union uh, who are basically making sure that it remains an important grouping and it remains a cohesive grouping. So how do you see Germany's role as uh, the president of EU for next six months? Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with Walter. Um, as Walter said earlier, the, the European Union is going through a, a defining moment. Uh, we have been confronted with an unprecedented challenge with this COVID crisis. And what we get from the European citizens is a clear wish for a stronger and more resilient Europe to face the um, effects of the crisis. And the European Union has presented very ambitious plans to meet these expectations. Uh, in order to, to get out stronger of the crisis, the European Union must be equipped with an adequate recovery plan commensurate to the needs. And what we are, that's exactly what we are doing now. The, the, the Commission has presented a proposal for a 750 billion euro a recovery instrument, which includes both grants and loans. And this is actually on top of a broader 2.4 trillion uh, recovery plan for Europe. Um, uh, we, we, which is meant to, to steer the EU towards a more sustainable digital and fair uh, future. So th these investments are not just meant to preserve the, the, the achievements of the past 70 years, but, but these investments want to ensure that the union is climate neutral, is digital, is socially responsible, and is a strong global player. So. The, the European Green Deal and the digital transformation uh, will be the red thread running through uh, the entire recovery strategy put in place by the European Union. Mm -hmm. And this uh, strategy is underpinned by the concept of solidarity. Uh, solidarity between EU member states, this will remain the keystone of all EU actions, but also solidarity between generations, if I may say so. That, that's also part of the philosophy of the Green Deal. We want to, 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 um, to preserve an environment which is fit for the welfare of future generations, and action is needed now in that respect. And solidarity also to consolidate, to strengthen our economic and monetary union. And I'm, I'm very glad to say that Germany has been um, a strong supporter of the ambitious plans set out by the European Union institutions. And um, I'm pretty sure that during the six months of the German presidency of the Council, I uh, will be able to make significant advances. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter, sir, uh, COVID crisis is one of the biggest crises of, uh, of not only this year, but since World War II. Uh, how do you see collaboration with India when it comes to dealing with this pandemic uh, uh, now, given the fact that uh, Germany has an important role uh, to play, not only uh, at the EU, but also at the UNSC and also perhaps FATF, but of course FATF has no role when it comes to COVID crisis. But uh, regarding these two uh, groupings and collaboration with India on the crisis. You see, <clears throat> if you go back to March when we have started, when the lockdown started, we, uh, since then we have um, begun our um, uh, repatriation um, uh, activities and we have repatriated only Germany already, 5,000 5, Germans and Europeans and also Indians. So have done the French, so have done the Dutch, so have done the Spaniards, the Italians, others. So in all this, we needed a, a close cooperation with um, the authorities, be it local, be it with the ministries. And this was an excellent cooperation until now. You know, this were under lockdown conditions to do these evacuations. It's needed quite a a close and trustful cooperation, and we had it. And I think I, uh, it, it was a very good example of how it worked. And it works also the other way when you do now your repatriation 
programs from uh, European countries to uh, to India. So this was a, a very good start already. It showed uh, the the stable relationship. Now on the on the help side, of course, also there we had a lot of bilateral and uh, contacts between European countries and um, uh, India uh, on masks, on um, products for medicals, uh, and uh, all the all the um, uh, contracts which were signed before co Corona were were minutiously um, um, implemented by both sides. So I think this is also important that we showed some solidarity in this time of need. Afterwards, now it, it, when we have the, the second phase or third phase now, I think there's a lot of help also pouring in from, from Germany, for example, we have half a, half a million, half a billion uh, euro for products with cre credits for, you know, reliefs in hospitals and feeding the poor. And I'm sure many other countries in the European Union also do this. I've seen from, from several countries that they are doing similar projects. So I think this is also a very active show of solidarity, which we do. And in the future looking, I think we also uh, draw same conclusions, meaning we have to work more on the, on the multilateral side. We have to, uh, to do more on the vaccine uh, uh, research together, research institutions. So this, is, this will be a booming sector, I guess, in the future. And this is a, a field of much more cooperation uh, possibilities in the future. A lot of possibilities. Uh, but Ugo, sir, we have heard uh, the word green recovery a lot from European Union. So if you can shed some light on uh, the green recovery, what is the concept all about how European Union is taking a lead on it? Yes, well, um, uh, the fact is that containing the virus and, and saving lives has been our immediate focus, obviously, um, uh, rightly so. But we, we should always remember that climate change, biodiversity loss and the, ex the unsustainable use of resources uh, and pollution. These, these, are re these remain existential challenges that will need to be, to be tackled. So they are as relevant now as ever. Actually, if anything, COVID has, has made even more evident that we need to tackle to address these challenges. And the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the Paris Climate Agreement and the biodiversity goals remain crucial if we want to better keep the word for, for a future systemic shock, such as the one we are experiencing now. Now, the, the European Union post-COVID recovery strategy um, is basically a transition to a sustainable, socially just and um, resilient and climate neutral uh, future. Uh, we, we believe there is no contradiction between economic growth and the protection of the environment. Uh, actually, the, the opposite, in, in a way, it's, a, it's an opportunity. The, the, mass, the massive investments that are needed in Europe as elsewhere to, to kickstart for, for the recovery of our economies must reflect this new paradigm. We, we, we need to get it right, right, right from the start with mm. our recovery strategies. And that is why in our, in our strategy, we, 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 want, I mean, we want to design a strategy which is a once in a generation opportunity not just to build back but to build better to reshape our economies and mm -hmm. to invest in a green economy for the 21st century not just to and not just in a carbon economy which was uh, typical of the past century so we are committed to a green digital resilient and socially just recovery Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have put in place a number of instruments, I, I, I mentioned some of them earlier, where, where every euro of investment um, is supposed to accelerate this, this twin green and digital transition and, and build a fairer and more resilient society. Just to make a few examples, there are some areas where you can take action and get immediate and reap immediately benefits in the building sector. Uh, mobility with the electrification of mobility, energy with, with, with the new emphasis on renewables and, and clean hydrogen. And in all these, obviously, we very much stick to our ambition uh, for Europe to be the first um, climate neutral continent by 2050. We, we, we want to ensure that, the, uh, that growth can be decoupled from the unsustainable use of resources. And we want to promote a circular economy fighting biodiversity loss. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So th- that's in uh, in sum is the philosophy of our efforts. We want a greener future for for the next generation. A greener future, but uh, uh, Walter, sir, as Germany heads the UNSC, United Nations Security Council is one grouping uh, to which all the countries look up to so that they can take some decisive action. But UNSC has been found missing during the COVID crisis. It can't even come out with a resolution. So how will Germany make sure that there is some concrete action when it comes to dealing with the COVID pandemic by the UNSC? Well, the United Nations, whoever worked there, knows that everything works on, on consensus and especially um, in the Security Council, um, you, ha- you have uh, veto powers and you have uh, complex um, discussions between different uh, countries and blocks of interest. So this is not the easiest deal, but I'm a strong, and Germany is a strong, strong supporter of the United Nations. So is Indian, uh, our Indian friends. Um, the UN might be um, uh, flaw, <laughs> might have lots of flaws. It's true. It's not perfect and. Sometimes, you know, we think we lose our patience, but there's no, nothing better. So we have to support this one, which we have. So that's why we are very strong supporters of everything dealing with multilateralism. That's why we have this uh, a, a special um, uh, initiative to support the multilateralism, which means everything has to be done together. There's no country which is big enough, neither India, nor China, nor Russia, nor the US, big enough to solve any challenges of the future, be it climate change, be it poverty, be it um, uh, uh, terrorism, ma- many other things. Everything has to be done in, in, in cooperation with other countries. This has been shown by this pandemic now. That's why we think we have to support it. We have to support WHO and others. Now, why hasn't the Security Council not yet brought out a product on on the th- threat of inter- uh, international security by um, pandemics? Because the discussions are complex there, and that's why we and the French before us put it on the agenda again. I think there's tomorrow an open debate in the Security Council on this um, to- special topic, but things take a while in, in the UN because it's a compromise uh, body. And once again, um, uh, because I, I con- we congratulated, of course, India for the membership, for being elected to as non permanent members from, from January on. When we will leave the Security Council for this period in, 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 in December, India will take over. And we both are strong uh, supporters of the opinion that this uh, Security Council has to be reformed. It's not representing anything uh, which has to do with 2020. It's representing the reality of 1948, and this has to change. And it, otherwise, the UN loses credibility as as such. So uh, another thing where we have a lot of common ground with uh, with India. Mm-hmm. But sir, do you see India Germany becoming part of the UNSC because there are member countries uh, who are pa- permanent members of the UNSC who are not perhaps willing so much to give space to um, new countries or perhaps uh, perhaps reflect the realities of uh, uh, 2020. It's a good question because we we're working on this. I mean the UN. Uh, Many countries in the UN work on this since 30 years, the working groups on reforming the Security Council, working methods and membership. This is a very complex issue and everyone who has worked in India, in, in, in New York, and I have worked there also in this, on this topic, knows how complex this is. We think there's a majority, overwhelming majority for changing the membership because it's not, you can't understand why is there no India, with 1.4 billion people, why are they not in the Security Council? This is just simply not acceptable. Why is there no African country? Why is there no Latin American country? This is, in, this is impossible to grasp. It has to change. Now, if, if there are interests and countries who are not in favor of this or, or try to slow it down, then they risk the credibility of the UN system as such. That's what we say since years. And that's why we work slowly, slowly in the G4, but also in other groupings to change this. And um, uh, in India will continue so when they are now in the Security Council. So I think it's, 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 the time is, is ripe to do this now. now. Mm-hmm. The time is right uh, to do this now. Uber, sir, uh, currently we know the crisis. We have been talking about it uh, so much so it looks like uh, an old theme now. But uh, 
how EU and India are cooperating amidst this crisis, the COVID pandemic, uh, how both the countries are uh, uh, coming together, uh, perhaps uh, coming for partnership on various issues, whether it's vaccine or making sure that there is no repetition of this crisis? Well, uh, the, the EU and India share the same values of uh, democracy, of pluralism, we are, we are open societies. And we also strongly believe in multilateralism, in a cooperative approach to international relations. And, and it is a commonality which is particularly relevant now, as we all face a global crisis which requires a collective uh, response. And uh, I think that the UN and India share priorities that will be central when we shape um, the world's agenda in a post-COVID world. Uh, we need to fight climate change, we, we have to work for a greener, for a greener and, and sustainable future. Uh, we want to foster research. Um, we, we, we both focus on the digital future. And uh, we need to build resilience in our economies, in our health systems. And we want to make the access to vaccines uh, equitable and um, universal. And in, in fostering all these objectives, we, we also want to uphold our values, uh, supporting a rules-based um, uh, system of world governance grounded in uh, multilateralism. So I, I, I think there is a lot of ground where the European Union and India can work together and do work together, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in, in, in the past few years, we have already developed a number of um, cooperative ventures. Let, let me mention a few, such as the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Partnership, the, the India-EU Water Partnership, the India-EU Partnership for Smart and Sustainable Urbanization, and the uh, Resource Efficiency Initiative. So there is already quite a lot ongoing, and I'm, I'm confident that the the next EU India summit will act will, will further strengthen this cooperation and strategic partnership and will broaden its scope in the light of the new challenges uh, emerging mm -hmm. after the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, talking about the European Union or Europe, it was once the epicenter of the crisis. We know the situation in Italy and Spain. How is the situation now? And we have also heard that Europe is slowly, slowly opening. They are allowing a certain countries. Perhaps India is included in that list and. Perhaps there are some countries, perhaps Americans, they're, they're not included. If you can talk about, about that, uh, those reports, and of course, uh, the, the situation right now in uh, Europe. Well, the, the situation is progressively improving. Uh, you, 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 can see, um, um, you can see that clearly in the figures of the cases pending and the, and the figures of the casualties. But this doesn't mean that we can uh, lower our guard. It's um, uh, the, the reaction of the European Union is based on scientific evidence that what is guiding us all, individual member states and the European Union institution in its efforts to coordinate. And we will continue to do so in the coming weeks, uh, weeks and months, obviously also in close coordination with our international partners. Mm -hmm. uh, so now uh, talking about another crisis, perhaps uh, here in India, it's more visible. It is uh, the dragon in the room. That's China. Uh, Walter, sir, how do you see uh, China currently in the world? It is uh, very assertive, not only with India, with the rest of the, uh, the country. So how do you see uh, China and, of course, uh, its relationship uh, with, uh, with Germany? Well, you see... Every fifth person on this planet is Chinese, and every fifth person on this planet is Indian. Which means it shows you the dimension of these two giants. Call them Hercules and giant, call them dragon and elephant. It, it shows the size, it shows the importance. And that's why it's not, an, not, a, not, not something to be taken lighthearted if there are tensions and even violent tensions as we have seen there. For us, especially in Germany, where, where you have lived for 40 years on the verge of the Cold War, uh, always staring at soldiers on the other side and not knowing what would be the next threat, we know the, 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 the precious steps to be done to ease tensions. So when we see these tensions arising, which is very worrisome because it's not only the, you know, the most popular countries, 
populated countries, but also nuclear states. So any tension there is a worry for everyone in the world. So that's why we support every step which can be done to ease those tensions. And I'm happy to read um, that there are talks going on to try to um, de-escalate the situation. That's the way to go, and this is how we see it. Otherwise, there are, of course, uh, a, a lot of relationships between our countries in Europe and China, but also with India. So that's why um, we, we want to see that these tensions are easing and are, are not, not increasing. So this is our position on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ugo, sir, what's your take uh, uh, when it comes to China, the relationship between China and the EU, and of course, uh, an increasingly assertive China with uh, the region, with its neighborhoods, from um, India to Japan to uh, Taiwan to Vietnam, it's a whole host of uh, lists. Well, uh, what I can say is that the relationship between the European Union and China is multifaceted. It's strategically important, but it's also challenging. Um, China is at the same time uh, a competitor, uh, a partner uh, on issues such as the fight against climate change and a systemic rival. So I, uh, let me quote here what the president of the council, Charles Michel, said uh, at the end of the last EU-China summit, which has just taken place. Engaging and cooperating with China is both an opportunity and necessity. But at the same time, we have to recognize that we do not share the same values, political systems, or approach to multilateralism. So we will engage in a clear-eyed and confident way, robustly defending EU interests and standing firm on our values. Mm -hmm. Overall, the, the EU stance, I can say, has become more realistic. And in parallel, it's very important that we strengthen the EU cooperation with the other major Asian partners, such as uh, India, notably mm -hmm. India, but also Japan, South Korea, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, so my last question uh, before I let you go uh, is one of a very philosophical question about the, the year 2020. Uh, how do you think that 2020 has changed the global geopolitics, uh, the repercussions on global geopolitics, the rise of new powers and of course uh, 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 the pandemic or uh, something which nobody had thought of uh, changing the lifestyle of everyone on this planet? Walter, sir, first to you and then Uwe, sir, coming to you. Well, uh, if there is one thing that the crisis has taught us, is that the pandemic spares no one. It stops at no border. It recognizes no difference. So tackling this global crisis and its consequences requires multilateral solutions. It requires cooperation. It requires solidarity. We need to work together to address the challenges of the epidemic and its aftermath, including the economic fallout, and we need to implement a recovery strategy that is green, fair, and sustainable. So I think the main lessons from this crisis is we, we need multilateralism more than ever. We need to work together. And we need to um, give a new emphasis to a future which is green and sustainable and mm -hmm. respect for biodiversity and the environment. Mm -hmm. Walter, sir, your take, sir? Yeah, pretty much on the lines of, of Hugo. I mean, as, as understandable it is after Corona to think local, to think national, to re-nationalize things and to produce things, you know, be, being, being less dependent from other countries. As, as understandable this is, I hope the tendency is in the, goes the other way. We have seen through this crisis that we only can um, survive and we only can prosper if we work together. In, in health systems, in solidarity, and in multilateral rules. So that's that's why um, uh, I, I think if we draw lessons from from this crisis, it will be one um, more multilateralism, more working together in WHO, in, in international agreements, forums, and second, um, when we start re reconstructing, rebuilding, and recovering. Let's let's remember, for example, in India, how, how, how nice it was to have a clean Ganges, to have clean air in Delhi, to have less polluted cities. Um, maybe when we reconstruct, rebuild, we can keep this in mind to maybe not preserve it as we had it now in this last three, four, five months, but let's go the way which Hugo has described, 
let's go the green way, let's go a way which makes us responsible parents to our children and children's children, because the planet which we have is one. If we mess it up, it's our fault. And we have to give something to our children, and, and we only can do it if we learn lessons from this crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much Paul, for speaking to Vion and it's nice to have the EU envoy and the German envoy together on the same platform talking about uh, not only how the world is changing but talking about how they're collaborating with New Delhi. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome.